right? Vahasafsuf Asher Ba'am Hitawu Ta'awa They had a great uh, desire and with this desire they ended up uh, getting themselves punished, they ate the slough and the Qaj uh, burnt them uh, up and, uh, and that's why the place is called Qivrot Ta'awa because Hashem, literally these are the, the tombs that were created uh, by this Ta'awa, by this uh, lust is the English word, okay? Desire is a, uh, is a Frankic uh, root Okay, go back to the Latin. In uh, lust is a German, a Germanic root. Okay, in modern German they use like I have lust to do something. It means I have desire to do it. In English, which is the case sometimes in modern Hebrew they do this too between Old Tanakh Hebrew and Aramaic, they'll take two words with identical meanings but different etymological roots or different language roots altogether, and they'll use them to mean different things, like different degrees of intensity. So in English we have desire, which is a kind of polite, simple, uh, nouvelle cuisine kind of, uh, you know, two peas and a string bean, that, that kind of, a little appetite, a little desire. And we use the Germanic lust to say uh, some tremendous, um, a tremendous appetite for something. What would, how would you describe the difference between ta'avon and ta'awa? If you had to actually put a definition to it, and, and you do. If we have two words, there's a difference between them, what would the difference be? Where would you draw the line? Of the intention behind. Then there is something. Uh, there is a positive. There is something positive versus something negative. So is it positive to have? Is it possible to have a negative tavon or a tavon for something not good? Right. No. Maybe. Maybe not. I mean, I don't know that the. You're saying in terms of the object. The object of my desire is what determines if it's a desire or a lust. No, so if I want cocaine, that's a ta'awa. If I want uh, corn, that's a ta'awa. No, but you can also have it in the, with, with regular food. If I want to eat something because I like it, and it's a, I, I, want, I, I enjoy it, it's a positive feeling. If I will kill somebody for the same food, then it becomes something negative. Like it depends also the way I want the object. It's, it, you know, it's on me. The food is right. the same. So it's not just the object itself. Right. It's a function of severity or intensity. Or it can be, yeah, or it can be, yeah, probably the question of well, where, where would you draw the line? Where would you draw the line between Ta'avon and Ta'awa? In other words, what, what, at what point have I crossed the border between Ta'avon and Ta'awa? When I, I lose sight of, of what it is is the desire for an external object that all of a sudden becomes so fundamental to me that I do things that I wouldn't do normally for it and I shouldn't do normally for it. Okay, now we're cooking with gas. When you lose, would you be offended if I said control? Yeah. When you lose control over your tavon, what you end up with is a tawa. Fair enough? I can give you a lot of examples of this. But I was about to put it very, very uh, eloquently once. He said that Moshe Rabbeinu put up with a lot of difficulty in the Midbar. He dealt with uh, people not having imuna, people not having patience, uh, people refusing to believe, refusing to accept, refusing to, uh, to submit, people who believed they were uh, um, equally uh, or even better uh, qualified than him to lead the nation or that he was uh, incompetent or incapable as a, as a leader. At Kivrota Ta'awa, this is the first time you actually find Moshe Rabbeinu really losing it. Losing it. He loses, it's, you would almost say he lost control. He didn't lose control. He lost his patience completely and totally with the nation. That's when he gets up, he raises his hands, he says, I can't do this anymore. Okay? I can no longer deal with, uh, here he's talking to Akhal Shabbat, here pieces in the Parashat Devarim. But he's saying, I can no longer carry this nation, right? I, I can no longer... What did I, did I uh, carry them, as if to say, during pregnancy? Did I give birth to these people that you tell me carry them like a, like a, a nurse carries a baby? This is, this is what you're telling me? The nation's full of babies. The nation's full of babies. So how would you describe the difference between a baby and an adult? Maybe certain intellectual faculties are a little bit more developed, a little bit more sophisticated in adults. Very classically, very classically, things like the ability to delay gratification, the ability to consider alternative courses of action, uh, being in control of yourself and in control of your words and your actions, 
is pretty typically associated with adulthood. That's fair. That's an honest assessment. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I quit. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells him, don't worry, I'm going to bring them meat. If what they want is meat, I'm going to give them meat. Of all things, he gives them quail, these tiny little birds. It's a very funny story. Um, but at the end of the day, Moshe even challenges Hashem. And he says, how could it be? You're going to slaughter all the cattle in the world. It's going to be enough for this nation. You give them all the lambs, all the goats, nothing. All the fish in the sea is not going to be enough for them. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, well, Hashem tiktsar. What, Hashem is incapable of, 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 of providing for these people? So... Moshe loses control. What's about this is why? Three days into the desert, they're complaining, we don't have water. No, we don't have water, we have water. The water, the water is bitter. We don't like the taste of the water that we have. So, you don't like the water, Moshe prays, he throws uh, olive wood into the, uh, the water, there's a miracle, the water is sweet, now they can drink it. Right? Sham sam lo, mishpat sham misam. Then, a week, Barely goes by, they're already complaining, they want bread. Who's going to give them bread, at least with regularity? What are they going to eat the entire uh, trip from here to Eretz Yisrael? It'll take them, what, a few weeks? Then they get the man. That's Parashat B'Shalach. Okay, you wanted water, you got it. You wanted bread, no problem, taken care of. When they start crying about, and this is the Parashat, where the, the nation themselves, and you see this, they want garlic and onions and... Uh, and uh, gourds, uh, all sorts of hatzir. Literally, they're asking for, for herbs. For fish, apparently they were eating fish in Egypt, but their appetite to have control. You have the man, you have water. This sustained you for the past couple of years. You really can't go without it. You really don't think that you know, if you don't eat meat now, you're going to explode. So Rasabato said, a tavon becomes, by definition, a reasonable, rational, uh, fair, justified uh, appetite. And the proof that it's reasonable, fair, just, etc., is that it can be satiated. I can give you water. If that's what you're missing, I can help you. If you're looking for bread, I can give you bread. If what you're missing is emunah, even this, I can say, Tov, I'm not just going to give you bread. I promise you the man is going to come with a regularity. It's going to be there every morning. The hamashemesh v'namas, when the sun gets hot, it's going to melt. But you'll know you'll have more man the following day. When the nation goes out of control, and they say, wait a second, we have the man, we have the water, but I need something... Fancier. I need something uh, more interesting, even if it's simple vegetables or, or, or fish. And here, Moshe Rabbeinu, the argument that he has with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it's not a function of, can HaKadosh Baruch Hu provide them with as much meat? He created the world, he can give them as much meat as he wants. His argument with Hashem is, this nation's desires are unlimited, they're infinite. All the meat in the world is not going to satiate them, because they're going to eat today, they're going to want more tomorrow. They're going to eat tomorrow, they're going to want even more the following day. This has become a ta'wah. The Torah defines this as a ta'wah when it tells you this is out of control. Their appetite has taken control of them and it's never going to be satisfied. Never going to be satisfied. Fast forward to the 21st century according to the, uh, the Christian count in the Common Era. <coughs> How would you describe the difference between someone who's hungry and someone who's, let's say, addicted to something? Right? Let's assume for argument's sake, heroin. Heroin's a good example. Or, be more polite, oxycontin. But it's the same thing. Well, the difference is that if you're hungry and you need to eat, it's good for you. If, you want, if you're on crack or heroin or whatever, it is bad for you. And that's pretty much But I get sick when I don't take it. I get stomach cramps. You don't cramps No, you get physically sick. sick. You get physically uh, you, have, uh, you get have more experience. You don't know what you're missing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you can get you can get uh, constipation, diarrhea, stomach cramps, for uh, insomnia for a certain period of time, for a few days, up to a, a week or two. Sure. Okay. Uh, the food. I'm gonna eat it now. I'm gonna be hungry later. I'm gonna have breakfast. I'm gonna have to get lunch. I'm gonna have lunch. I have to have breakfast. I'm gonna have to have uh, dinner. It's still good for you in the end. Okay. It it remains under my control. It doesn't take control of me. I remain in control of it more or less. Are there people who are addicted to food? Foods of different kinds? And how would you describe them? Addicts. I mean, food addicts. Yeah. People who can't stop eating. People who are morbidly obese. Or people who have uh, disorders, sugar, blood pressure, whatever it is. And they, and they can't stop themselves from eating. This is the difference between Ta'avon and Ta'awa. The time of the Torah, they didn't have drugs the way we have them today. Today everything is much more refined and distilled and concentrated. So uh, they had opium, but not... You know, in the concentrations that it's used uh, today in these drugs or in the uh, the narcotics. Yeah, the alcohol. No. 
They had, but they didn't have distilleries. So the, the most alcoholic pro beverage you could get was wine. They could make wine out of, uh, out of other fruits and vegetables, but, you know, at the end of the day, wine was... So because if it was 12 or 13 or 14 percent, it was as, as, as alcoholic as drinks get. Uh, the distillery was invented, I think, only in the 17th century. So that's where you boil off the uh, methyl alcohol, you retain the ethyl alcohol, you can repeat the process, and you, you lose water in the process, but you can keep the alcohol pretty consistently. So you can, you know, quadruple the concentration of alcohol even more if you keep on doing the process. By the way, the case of the Kibratawa itself, I think the, the Midrash says that what they were really missing were the sexual liberty of Egypt. So, the, the reason it's called Ta'awa and the reason it's associated with other Ta'awa is because the Torah doesn't call sexual relations a Ta'awa per se. It uses a different expression, which is... Uh, <coughs> no? It's referred to sometimes as Tevel, oh. which is understood to be a form of abomination, but more typically, you have uh, to'eva, okay? Very interesting, the etymology here. To'eva, the root is tau ein bet, okay? Where le ta'ev means to disgust, or to make something uh, repulsive, or, or uh, to ruin it effectively. Uh, to make it, uh, as if to disgust it for someone else, to make it disgusting or repulsive for someone else. Ta'ev with an aleph, you're familiar with the concept of the ayin and the aleph, right? Very commonly, you have a word in Hebrew. Doesn't matter where the aleph or the ayin appear. When you interchange them, the aleph represents something more abstract, and the ayin is something more material. We're on the topic of material, so ayin is more material. The materiality of the ayin. So I have, for example, osher in Hebrew, which means what? Uh, well, osher, osher with an aleph. You, you, you hear like a so osher. Like, you pronounce it. Asher means, means wealth. Asher with an ayin means wealth, like Asher, Lasri in Arabic, last name, rock and last name, Lasri. So, Asher with an ayin means, uh, wealthy. An ayin means uh, wealthy, in, in, in material terms. What does Asher with an aleph mean? The Ashri ki ishiruni barot wa tekrash mo'ashri. Ashri, same thing. It's annoying uh, English. Happy or something? Like, uh, well, Ashri uh, means the, literally the praises of. Content? Contentment. Right? Contentment, uh, satisfaction, something like that. Right. My wife's name is Oshrat, the same root, but her, she named after her grandmother, uh, Khiria. It sounded a little bit less Arabic in Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> right? Khir, khir in Arabic is like good, better. <laughs> so, uh, so, Osher is contentment. It's not necessarily material. Perhaps it's antithetical to spiritual contentment to be uh, physically heavy, to be physically materially uh, wealthy. Uh, you have you have other examples of this, many of them, in fact. It's not hard to uh, to find. So uh, the the another example is classically anyway would be uh, el and al, which by the way was copied from the navi el al, which means up and away, like up and above. That's where they got the name for the uh, the Israeli uh, airline. But uh, so el alef lamad in Hebrew means what? God. Not, uh, not El with a Tzere, El with a Segol. So, sure. so El, two, okay, like generally direction. two towards, uh, on the topic of, um, and then you have Al with an Ein, which means what? On. On, or on top of. That's a little bit more tangible. So El refers to a more general kind of towards something, you know, a general topic of. Al, on it. You're sitting on it. So... Bikitsur, uh, the, the point at which you're no longer in control of your appetite, but your appetite is in control of you, is where you lose this. It becomes a ta'awa, it becomes a, a, a bottomless pit, it becomes a problem. Something very similar I heard from this, from the, uh, the director of the uh, Ritorno uh, Drug Rehab, uh, Addiction Rehabilitation Clinic in Israel. It's right outside of Bet Shemesh. Designed for really, it started in uh, in uh, Mexico. A lot of the wealthy Jewish kids in Mexico got in problems and in, in trouble with drugs. They had nowhere to go, and they ended up dying of overdoses. It's a crazy thing. So, uh, so they have now. They do for gambling. They do the uh, drug and alcohol uh, addictions. And believe it or not, sexual addictions are a thing now. Since Bill Clinton, they've recognized that there is such a thing as uh, as addictions to uh, certain kinds of uh, deviant uh, behaviors. 
and uh, it's it's become institutionally recognized that uh, you know the treatments for this kind of an addiction are pretty much the same treatments of uh, of any other kinds, any other forms of uh, of addiction. Except here, it's not an addiction to uh, a particular substance per se. It's just the activities, the behaviors, the fantasies, the thoughts, etc. So, very interesting story. And again, this is just the nature of the material, so you'll have to bear with me. There was, uh, they told us a couple of, of stories of people who were actually on site at the point, at that time. One of them was strong enough to talk about his problem. He was in, uh, a recovering heroin addict. Uh, and a few others obviously weren't at that point just yet, but they could talk about it, so they, they were okay with their story being told by someone else, you know, anonymously. So he told us of, uh, of a guy, a religious guy, who actually taught in a religious uh, institution, right? We'll call it a yeshiva. And this guy had a problem where he had uh, this, this Clinton syndrome of, uh, of basically an addiction to uh, autoerotic uh, behavior. So, it is what it is. Hashem Rahim. So, the guy didn't think it was a big deal. He knows it's a sur, it's, uh, but everybody used the, you're going to see this quoted a number of times that, you know, maybe it's better than violating the Torah interdiction. What the Torah forbids explicitly is, is you know, uh, anal sex between two men. So if one has a desire for such a thing, maybe it's better to, you know, find a release that's not, at least it doesn't involve someone else, let's say, fine. Because the story of Er and Onan is an interesting one. We'll talk about that too. Anyway, uh, so the guy develops a problem where this becomes a very uh, addictive and repetitive behavior. And it came to the point that he decided to seek help, right? Obviously, it's a very personal issue. It's a difficult thing to bring up. So he goes to this place that he heard of through someone who knew someone who knew someone who had some kind of an addiction. And he goes to talk to the director of the program, right? And he presents himself as a you know, rabbi, learned guy, teaching yeshiva, etc. And so the guy says to him, okay, so, so why are you here? <laughs> You're a rabbi, that's great, everything is perfect. Well, is this thing, I'm not so sure, whatever, but, you know, I'm trying to work it out. What's the thing? Well, the thing is, this tava that I have for autoerotic behavior. So, and he starts asking him some questions, you know, what it is that triggers it when he thinks about it, and he says to him, and if you don't mind my asking, but, you know, like, how many times a day did this happen? And the guy says to him, mm, like, five or six, which is like, okay, that's... Uh, somewhat excessive, we would say, in the realm of mental health. And so he says to the guy, so let me ask you a question. He says, yeah, he says, you have this under control? He says, yeah, I think so, but you know, I, I'm trying to cut back. He says to him, do you enjoy it? And the guy started crying. The guy broke down, this is a grown man, started crying hysterically, and he said to him, no, 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 I don't enjoy it at all. It's just for me, it's become such a source of, uh, of tension, such an urge, that I'm not even doing this for pleasure, I'm just doing this to, to release the tension, like to just get it out of my head so I can go on with other things. And he says, I can't teach unless I do this, and I can't uh, go anywhere until I do this, and I can't, I can't think straight, I can't learn, like I have to go first do this, and then I can concentrate for a little bit, and then I have to go do it. So this is what the guy was explaining to us. This is the nature of addictions. It's when you are no longer in control of your appetites, when your appetites control you. And then the same guy told us, the, the director of the, the program, Tells the story about another guy who happened to be observant. The, the, the place was for observant people. It's not like everybody who's observant has problems. Not like nobody has no problems, but uh, he was telling a story about a guy who was really into helping people doing a kiruv hokim, you know, outreach, reaching out to people who aren't so observant. And he got in touch with a few people. You know, he had a very difficult upbringing, but he thinks about the shuvah, and he decided he's going to straighten out his life. So he goes to yeshiva. He learns. He loves it. And he spends the rest of his life reaching out to people like him who grew up on the street doing nothing or messing around with drugs. So this guy says he never did any hard drugs. And he found three guys that told him that they, they could use some help. They're looking for direction in life. They think that they, maybe if they start some kind of a business and they get their paranasa rolling, you know, it, it'll, it'll help them stay away from the negative elements. So they needed some money, and the guy says, look, I don't really, I can't afford it right now. I barely work on a yeshiva salary. I'm barely paying my, uh, my mortgage. But they drilled a hole in his head, and he said, fine. So he, he refinanced his mortgage. He gave them what amounted to a uh, hundred plus thousand uh, shekhil. And then he found out that the guys, as soon as they got the money, they disappeared. They went back to their drugs. They took off. He was at a loss. He couldn't pay his mortgage. Lost his apartment. He lost everything he had. He was married. He had five kids at the time. And he had to sleep in the street. 
ran into somebody who reminded him of somebody that he used to know when he was younger, Bekitsur. He wakes up one morning with a needle in his arm. So, it happened, you know, come the end of the day, well, my hand's itchy, but uh, it wasn't so bad. I think it, you know, calmed me down for a while, like it took the nerves out of my stressful day. So he goes back. And he ends up every day waking up somewhere else with a needle in his arm. In Akko, in Yafo, in Ramle. You know, so it came to a point where his wife gives him 150 shekel to go buy one of these massive, uh, you know, packages of diapers and baby wipes and a few other things they need for the house. And he spends all the money on heroin and, uh, you know, doesn't come home until the following day. Like, they realize something was wrong. So... Maybe in the beginning it has some kind of an effect, and then afterwards the effect wears off, and then it owns you, and then you can't stop, you can't do anything without treating it. Very interesting how the same word is used by the Torah to describe certain sexual behaviors. Everyone, man, woman, etc., everything in between, according to how they define it today, um, you know, everyone has some kind of fundamental drive. Just like we have a drive to eat and drink when we're hungry, we have a drive to sleep when we're tired. We also have some kind of a sex drive, something that naturally uh, leads you to, you know, to desire certain kinds of contact and certain kinds, certain forms of affection, physical, non-physical, etc. In some people, this is manifest differently. Okay, it's not manifest the same way uh, among everyone already within certain, let's say, more or less normative populations, but. Uh, the way this guy was describing it was he was saying, and it's a very interesting point. When the rabbi asks him, so why would you, it was a little bit explicit the way he put it, but why would you want to take your brit and stick it in a man's, you know, where? And the guy says, I don't know, why would a man want to do the same thing with a woman? Like, where's the logic? You're asking me a rational question. So I'm replying with a rational question. What would make someone in his right mind want to do this? Why does this sound normal or natural? that anybody would engage in any such behavior. Meaning, when you think about it a little bit abstractly, it's a kind of bizarre thing to want to do. Well, there's a time and a place for everything, but, you know, in, in his case, the point that he was making was that if you're looking for rationale or you're looking for logic, there is none. There is none. I don't think you're going to win the logical argument that without Torah, there would be a natural assumption on the part of society this behavior should be forbidden, or the behavior should be, uh, you know, condemned in any way. Me, personally, I am very offended by people who try to make rational, logical arguments for the Torah. I get this all the time. No, the only reason the Torah forbids eating pork is because uh, they have uh, trichinella, you know, trichinosis, these uh, parasites. Okay, so you sterilize it, you cooked it, you, you, you brought it past 140 degrees Fahrenheit, it's done. Okay, or you froze it for that matter. Is clean pork kosher? Or for that matter, is dirty beef non-kosher? If you can reduce the Torah to rationale and logic, whatever you think is rational and logical is going to be your Torah, and whatever I think differently is going to be my Torah. We don't need, it's nice and it's helpful to look for reasons, to connect mitzvot one to another, to compare and contrast them, the mitzvot, the avirot. It's a very, very informative exercise. But to say that there's a logical rationale behind it, there isn't. There isn't. And when we had discussions about morality, Morality, especially as far as the Torah is concerned, is not necessarily, by definition, uh, utilitarian law. Utilitarian law is very simple. I'm not going to steal from Adam, because I don't want Adam to steal from me. And if he respects me and I respect him, we can have a society without theft. As long as it benefits everyone, as long as everyone wins, it's a win-win situation. Sure, it's an easy sale to make. Okay? If I want to keep Shabbat, and Adam doesn't want to keep Shabbat, what rational logical, reasoned argument can I make against him working on the Shabbat? You should rest, I rest at night. You should take a vacation every couple of months, I do. You should rest specifically on Shabbat. In fact, from the time the sun sets until the time the stars come out. Why is this rational or logical? It makes sense on certain levels, but if it's subject only to my rational or logical approval, you're going to scrap 90% of the mitzvot. Just the way it is. I don't think the korbanot are rational or logical. I don't think the laws of Kashrut, we know for a fact, the Torah doesn't describe them as rational or logical laws. When it comes to the Arayot, when it comes to uh, sexual behavior, we have an awful lot of mitzvot relating to this. Most of them relate to who you can't have relations with. That's why the Rambam labels this entire section of the Mishneh Torah, Ilchot Isurebiah, the Harachot of Forbidden Sexual Relations. Okay, so no siblings, no parents, children, etc., Grandparents, certain kinds, the rest for sure, I mean, 
The list is a pretty long and exhaustive list of people that you're not allowed to, uh, to be with. Fine, fair enough. Is this necessarily what we would call a chok or a mishpat? Chukim mishpatim. Mishpatim are the, the rational, logical look. You got caught stealing, you pay back what you stole, plus a certain penalty. That's okay, it's not disagreeable to anybody. Do you believe, or has anyone ever led you to believe, that the sexual laws are, by definition, logical, rational things? I mean, if you uh, believe that logic and ration, rationale should dictate that this is how people should conduct themselves, or they shouldn't, I'll tell you it's not so. Because if you look around you, I've never met one secular society that has a concept, for example, of nida. In Islam, just for the first couple of days, they're not together. Okay, that's basically it. Why the strictures, why the Deoraita, the Rabbanan, Minahag, I mean, it's a pretty involved and, and somewhat complicated area of Halakha. But for what? If it were rational and logical, everybody would do it. Does that have to be rational and logical to us as Jewish people? Because I would say that, you know, following these rules serve the purpose of procreation for the Jewish procreation, and that's rational and logical. So you're talking about Nida, you're talking about homosexuality? I'm talking about who you can and cannot sleep with, not Nida. Okay. So you're telling me that I'm physically incapable of procreating with my sister? You, well, it's not going to be, it's, it's going it, to, you know... There is. There's genetic defects and whatnot. And uh, even these genetic defects, you're talking about percentages. It could be less than 25%. Okay, but still, it's a percentage. There was a story in the news recently of a couple from Ohio that moved to New Jersey. Because in New Jersey, consensual incest is not illegal. In fact, it was, and the, and the judges struck it down. Interesting. Two consenting adults, doesn't matter if they're siblings or not, because love is love. Right, right. Only well, well, right? Everything, love conquers all. So, I can still say that it's, you know, it's irrational and illogical because it doesn't serve for that purpose of procreation. You're telling me they're physiologically incapable of procreating. I'm not saying that they're incapable. I'm saying that but I'm going to tell you, they're going to do it. Let me right, save right. you. Oh, let's cut to the chase. Well, they're going to do it. All of the, everything that's even rational or, I mean, people kill, people murder, people steal. Right. People do it anyways. Okay. So just because they're going to do it doesn't mean that it's not... It's, it's irrational. There's a, a fine difference. Not a very gross one, but a fine difference. Okay? I'm not going to play, you know, John Kerry, like there's a rationale to Charlie Hebdo. No. But someone's mad, okay? And I'll tell you a funny story about this. Murder is, is funny on a lot of levels. I was, uh, I was driving once with a student from uh, Colombia, a guy from Hawaii. He was MTA at the time, he was in high school. His parents sent him from Colombia to uh, uh, to YU. There are no good Jewish boys' high schools in Colombia. You wonder why. And, uh, and as we're driving, we hear a story about it's on the news. I'm listening to the traffic. The story's about a couple in Patterson, a, a Latino-sounding uh, couple. So what happened? Uh, the ex-boyfriend got mad at the new boyfriend of the same girl. So he killed her and him and his three children from her, because of course already shooting you know. now, I don't remember if he killed himself or not it's not really germane to the discussion the guy so this guy jumps up and he says this rabbi is like in my country it happens four or five times a day <laughs> he's like in fact in Spanish we call it crimes de pasión you know, <laughs> you know uh, uh, crimes of passion they have telenovelas yeah, about this they write books about this in France people shoot each other all the time no but we have the same expression uh, yeah, 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 okay. Right, so there's something to be said for what they call the Romance languages, right? Yeah. <laughs> you think of Romance, you think of Rome. And, okay. So, uh, so I'm not justifying or defending an act of murder in a jealous rage. There's a part of it that you can identify with, and there's a part of it that you can't identify with. And if you want to be consistent with the, within the context of the discussion, jealousy is a very normal, natural human feeling, okay? I can tell you this from Bedin. Lots of couples come and go. I remember one guy who they got married and he was secular. He no, well, he was like about to shuba. She was from an Orthodox home and he was about to shuba. They got married. There were three kids into this wedding, into the marriage, and all of a sudden he decided he didn't want to be religious anymore. She found a razor in the garbage and a few things that uh, a few things that that indicated to her that he was no longer keeping the, the mitzvot. It started with one mitzvah, ended up with a few others. So the guy. So they were fighting back and forth, whatever, but she decided that's it. Uh, I want to keep Shabbat, I want to keep Kashrut, and I don't think this is going to work out if you don't respect this mitzvot. 
no problem. So he appoints me his uh, agent to write the get. I write it, the witnesses sign it, I dry it with a blow dryer because it's an old Moroccan custom. And we, it just makes the process faster. And make it, right? <laughs> so I fold it up and he takes it, right? And this whole time he's, he's super uh, stoic. That's the only way I can describe him as stoic. He doesn't blink, he doesn't move, he doesn't look at her, he doesn't talk or anything. And she is destroyed by this, but, uh, but she keeps her composure. So he hands, he puts the get over her hands, the way we do it, and he makes this declaration, you know, behold, this is your, uh, your get, and receive this get from me, and with it you'll be divorced from me. And, v'harat muterat l'choladam, we say, and you're hereby permitted to any man. Which means the get has to be given in such a way that I'm not divorcing you on the condition you can marry whoever you want, except for him, because he's a jerk, and I don't want you to marry this guy. Has to be a get, it's a total kritut, it cuts you off, it frees you, you can do whatever you want afterwards. And he choked on these words, he couldn't say it. He couldn't say it. And I'm sitting there as a guy, I'm just trying to think, put myself in his, you know, I mean, it was a job, but still, you try to sometimes identify the people that you're working with. And he couldn't let go of the fact that he really liked her and that maybe someone else was going to make her happy in a way that he can't. And for a man, that's a very difficult thing to comprehend. I mean, oh, well, if you like her that much and you think it's worth sacrificing for, so go ahead and sacrifice. You can do it. She didn't tell you not to. In fact, she would have loved for you to do it. I imagine they got into fights, they got into arguments, and the thing started as, you know, a snowball turned into an avalanche, and at the end, they just, already personally, they weren't compatible anymore. But that was the most difficult part. It wasn't so much, you know, I'm divorcing you, I want to move on with my life. As soon as he had to put a little bit of thought into her moving on with her life, and maybe there's going to be another guy who can make her happy, and I couldn't, and that was, it'll be his success and my fact. Then he choked. And, and he started crying. I've written maybe 200 gitin, three guys cried. Really? Only I counted. Three... <laughs> Three guys. Women more, I guess. Yeah, for the most part. I don't, even, I don't even think. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't even think. For the most part, I would say not even half of them. Maybe a little bit less than half. Because again, sometimes very acrimonious and you just want to get it over with. You hate each other over the bars. But anyway, he was one. It was two in the same day. That's why I remember that so vividly. <laughs> two guys in the same day. Him and the other guy. The other guy was a jerk. But this guy, you know, whatever. So. Um, so jealousy, I can understand. And not justifying killing people out of jealousy. What I'm saying is like, I didn't, I didn't jump the ship until you got to the point that you were ready to kill someone, you know? I, like, I've, I've had situations before where I was upset. I used to play hockey, I got upset. If he was playing and I wasn't playing, if he got the position that I wanted to do, whatever it is. You, jealousy, competition, it's a normal, natural thing. Everybody goes through it all the time. At work, in, in social circles, we're competing for each other's attention. Going from that point, you can be jealous and you can work it out. And you can work on your jealousy, you can work on building up positive things, you can work on improving things that you can improve. When your jealousy has consumed you to the point that you can no longer function until that guy is dead, and her, and your own kids from her, because of course, I'm mad at her, so I'm going to tell, take the kids too, you know, like, baby, the bathwater. That's where you've lost touch. This is where a, a tavon, where your desire to to compete, where your desire to let things hash themselves out has become, I have to control everything. There's no way this guy can be her boyfriend, because I once was her boyfriend, but we broke up, probably because I wanted to, and now I'm mad because, you know, she found somebody else. So that's insanity. But the insanity didn't start at the point of jealousy. The insanity started at the point where the jealousy became the only thing you can see. You woke up jealous, you ate breakfast jealous, you went to work jealous, you came home jealous, you woke up the next day even more jealous. That's where it totally takes control. My point, and the one that I think is really, really crucial to remember here, we're not talking about condemning people because their actions are irrational. Not because their actions are illogical, not because this isn't leading to procreation, because if that's the case, every husband and every wife should get divorced right around the time the woman turns 45 or so. Okay? And we don't normally recommend such a thing. In fact, we never recommend such a thing. On the contrary, usually if a couple makes it to an age like that, they'll stay married another 30 or 40 years. So, it's not, it's not on logical or rational grounds that we're going to condemn people for this behavior. And I want to make that really, really clear. Okay? You can't say what you're doing is, you can say, you can call it whatever you want, 
at the end of the day, we're libertarians, right? You can say whatever you want, you can offend or be offended, no one cares. We're not going to change the laws because you're upset. But, to condemn this and say, this is illogical or irrational, or say that it's immoral behavior, it's a value judgment of a very special kind. It really means you understand what morality is, what's behind it. The condemnation itself is not helpful. We can talk about this maybe a little bit more next week. But I don't think it makes sense to discuss it in that context. I don't think it makes sense to tell someone this is irrational behavior that we should legislate against. The Torah forbids the behavior. The Torah forbids lots and lots of behaviors. And we're all guilty of most of them. If not all of them, the difference is we don't act on certain behaviors. That's step one. I acknowledge this guy has a desire to do something, and maybe this woman too, we'll have to discuss that too. But I acknowledge this guy has a desire to do something that I don't have a desire to do. Okay? That also needs to be really clear. We all have appetites. I might not have this particular appetite, or not in this particular degree of intensity, but we all have appetites. So maybe the way I feel about women, he feels about men, maybe that makes certain things really complicated, like going to the gym or going to a swimming pool, but the desire in and of itself is only negative because of its manifestation, not because my desire is any more logical than his. Maybe it's more normative, people expect it from me like they expect it from everyone else. <coughs> but the nature of the desire, the authenticity of the desire, and the degree of intensity, I don't think it's for us to judge uh, on other people. So all the theory that, I mean, uh, not that I support it, but the theory that is a sickness or is completely unaccepted by a religious, uh, a Jewish, uh, Jewish view. That's, that's a very complicated question. In secular uh, psychology, up until the 1980s, the American Psychological Association, which, by the way, has the bizarre distinction of being the, the academic standard for citations and for the format in which you write dissertations. I don't know what it is about the psychologist that for some reason... The APA handbook. You never had to do reports. Oh. So they publish a handbook. It's the American Psychiatric Association. For some reason, it's, like, it's the standard for academic work. How your The pagination, the fonts, the paragraphs, citations where they appear in the order in which you quote the your publication, the publisher, the author, etc. Anyway, the APA, up until the 1980s, held that homosexuality was what they called a perversion. Okay? What does it mean, a perversion? So, a version of something is a path or a way towards it, like ver in French, V-E-R-S, towards a way of getting from one point to the other. A perversion just means another version, like a variation on, in what's in this case, normal. So normative behavior would be a man is attracted to a woman, a woman is attracted to a man, for whatever variety of reasons, and that's the standard version, the standard issue human being. They saw homosexuality as sharing lots of things in common with heterosexuality, in the sense that there's an attraction, that it's part physical, part uh, emotional, uh, that you know certain bonds are created, the expectations, etc. But it's not that having a sexual desire is a problem, it's just the way in which it was manifest that was problematic. And for that matter, it was pretty much in the same category as pedophilia. So, an older man, I don't know that would be, well, whatever. An older man finds himself attract, uh, attracted to, like, a young, let's say, prepubescent woman, that's very pathological. Like, normally, men aren't attracted to this kind of thing. If you are, it's very problematic. Uh, it can create all kinds of issues, legal issues, psychological, psychiatric issues. You know, you're attracted to something that society doesn't expect you to be attracted to. Uh, you're talking about little kids, it could be boys or girls, who don't have the ability to consent to what you would like to do. That's very problematic. In the 80s, they changed the, the definition uh, and they just called it an alternative, like a subcategory of the same behavior. People have sexual attractions, most of them are heterosexual, some of them are homosexual, but they don't treat it anymore as a disease, as a condition, as an issue. You can present yourself to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, to someone who has these tendencies. Legally, they're not allowed to advise you to change it. If you tell them you want to change it, they can tell you, here's what you can do to kind of suppress it. That's the, some of the, what we saw in the first half of the documentary. So, they're supposed to encourage you to find, reach out to groups and embrace it and do whatever you want. Halakhically speaking, there has been a lot of uh, discussion 
as to how we, we handle this. You're going to see some very insightful comments in the second half of that question. If you, if you approach it that way, like I'm speaking, you may have a heterosexual urge, but if you're not married, you are supposed to repress it anyway. So what's the difference? So this is the greater discussion of sexual urges in general. Yes, we expect people to be in control of their sexual urges. I hope that doesn't offend anyone. We really do expect people to be in control. In fact, we expect people to be in control of themselves pretty much all the time. Right. So you can eat, but you can only eat certain things. I don't care how much you eat. That's a health question. But as long as what you're eating is halakhically permissible, we can deal with it. Okay? We don't really prosecute these crimes. We have it for thousands of years. But it's, it's the kind of thing that falls under the umbrella category of normal. No one expects anyone to go around not being able to control their sexual desires. What's the catch? The catch is that in this case, if I'm gay, it's forever. It's, forever. Okay. it's not like sometimes you eat and sometimes you fast. Like, I have Purim, I have Yom Kippur. This is a permanent situation. It's a permanent state. I can't necessarily change this or adjust it if I never have any outlet. I never have a way of expressing this desire. Uh, it doesn't leave me very many options, basically. And yes, you will find with a great degree of consistency that the orthodox approach to this is celibacy. There isn't really much we can do about that. The Torah forbids just about everything else. We'll talk about that more in technical detail, in technicolor next week, in terms of what's permissible for etc. But uh, I think we'll continue with the, uh, with the documentary. Just food for thought is, is what I want to say. Now you're going to hear also one last comment. Some very bizarre opinions expressed in the name of supposedly orthodox rabbis. We're going to have to discuss them. If someone tells you, I'm a gay Orthodox rabbi, and I live with a man, and we have gay sex, so <laughs> at some point, maybe not so much. I mean, he can choose to identify as whatever he wants, I can identify as black. <laughs> I can identify... <laughs> Rachel Dulesal, I'm, I'm African American, my grandparents are born in Morocco. But not so much. So he can call himself whatever he wants, but no one else on the rabbinic panel that was interviewed here, considers him to be an orthodox rabbi. Uh, and the difference we'll talk about next week. What exactly, do orthodox men not have urges of different kinds? Maybe they do, but here he's a little bit, uh, well, I'll say out of the closet for time's sake. I don't think I have to tell what the light, Frank, can I do it Up to you. I'm impartial.